Hi everyone. Today's lecture is dedicated to object recognition. Um, this happens to be a um, domain of um, investigation which is um, which has always fascinated me and to which I have um, dedicated much of my uh, career. Um, today's will, um, discussion is focused on foundational theories um, that rely on um, neuroimaging and also on neuropsychological um, evidence uh, with respect to object recognition. In a bit more detail, um, the lecture objectives cover um, an attempt to understand the challenges posed by uh, object recognition. Why does the brain devote such a significant, such a tremendous amount of resources for solving this, um, this problem, the, the problem of object recognition? And uh, how do theories in the field, especially featural accounts, um, handle them and how successfully? Um, next, we will look into a specific uh, methodology developed for um, fMRI called repetition suppression and we'll see how it has been used to test whether object recognition is um, sensitive to the viewpoint or not and the extent to which um, this happens. We will look to, into um, the um, properties of the ventral stream of processing, the um, cortical pathway that um, supports uh, object recognition um, and to this aim we will look both in the um, into the fMRI evidence and um, at the uh, brain injured patients. We will see how knowledge representations might differ in those uh, who are born uh, without vision and then we will try to um, conclude with um, a discussion of a set of techniques uh, which over the last 20 years have become highly influential and uh, powerful um, in um, neuroimaging. They are labeled as um, multivoxel pattern analysis uh, or MVPA for short um, and they have opened up uh, some very interesting um, doors um, to both um, theoretical investigations and to practical uh, implications and applications of um, neuroimaging as we'll, um, we'll have the opportunity to see soon enough. Um, as to the um, skill building part of the lecture, today uh, we'll focus on um, scientific articles. We're going to start a longer discussion about how you can read or you should read a scientific article. And today we'll focus on um, the first part of a uh, typical um, uh, empirical paper, that being the abstract. Okay, so without um, further ado, what is the problem of object recognition? Um, and in simple terms, um, it's the problem of trying to make sense of our perceptual experience, in this case, visual experience. We view an object, let's say a coffee cup, and the image of that object is projected on our retinas, at the back of our eyes. Then somehow, the brain has the right machinery to transform that image on the back of our eyes into a representation, into something with a, with a label Starbucks coffee in this case. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a cup of coffee. It can be a backpack, it can be a chair, uh, it can be a laptop computer, it can be the face of a friend, um, many, many things. We have the ability to recognize all these things with a lot of ease, with a lot of speed, with a lot of accuracy. And because of that, it's not something that we typically think about very deeply um, in our daily lives. It's something that we often take for granted, but we know that the brain has a tremendous capacity and um, significant amount of um, um, hardware, so to say, um, dedicated to, um, to this problem. So um, how is this problem solved? Well, um, at the most general level, uh, what we do is trying to match new perceptual experiences to some presumably quite detailed visual representation of objects um, that we store in our visual memory. We recognize a cup of coffee as a cup of coffee because we previously encountered um, a cup of coffee and we detailed, we store the visual representation of how a cup of coffee should look like in, um, in our visual memory. 
Hence, we are able to identify a new instance of a coffee cup as such because we match it onto that uh, previously stored visual representation. We are able to recognize the letter G, let's say, because sometime, probably early in life, we found out what a G letter looks like or any other letter of any um, alphabet that we are familiar with. Um, and then the question comes to mind right away. What does that visual representation look like? What does the visual representation, for instance, of the letter G um, look like or of a letter L or of a letter A? And one of the simplest um, hypotheses um, is that what we do is store a template, a visual template. And you can think of that as a mental picture, as a, as a snapshot of an object's appearance. So perhaps the first few times when uh, somebody told us this is the letter G, what we did is take a mental snapshot of the appearance of letter G, a highly detailed representation of what the letter G should look like. And now every single time we encounter that, um, that letter in our lives, we're able to recognize it as the letter G because it matches, it is so similar to letter G and not to letter A or letter um, A or any other template for any other letter that we have, um, we have stored so far. Um, one problem with this account is that there's not one single um, representation probably of letter G since um, uppercase G looks quite different from lowercase G and depending on what font the appearance changes quite a bit as well. Uh, if it's a printed letter versus a, as opposed to a, a handwritten letter, again there's quite a bit of variability there as well. But we can conceive of that um, problem as being solved by appealing to multiple templates. So let's say you have one template for uh, uppercase G, another one for lowercase G, uh, probably one for a typical handwriting of the letter G and so on and so forth. So a handful of templates for one, uh, one object can probably take us a long way in terms of um, our ability to solve object recognition uh, with respect to that object. And if this is not clear enough, um, you can um, relate this to, um, to a barcode. So uh, by analogy, um, you can think of this as the way in which a barcode is, um, is used. It doesn't really matter whether that barcode is um, encountered in, a, in one store or another, um, at what time of day, whether it's printed on, um, on some type of paper or uh, on plastic. The identity of the object associated with that uh, barcode stays the same. In the same manner, you can think of multiple instances of, um, of, the, of a visual experience associated with viewing G um, being related to a unique template that stands for that letter. Okay, unfortunately though, um, just a handful of templates might not be able to solve our problem. Um, and this is what makes object recognition incredibly hard if you think about it um, with, uh, with a bit more thoroughness. For instance, if you view the same object from the front or from the side um, or from the top or from the bottom or from a three-quarter uh, view, the appearance of the object can change tremendously. Um, and again, that's not something that we put a lot of thought into, but if you can actually compare the images of the same object taken from different viewpoints, you can appreciate um, what a large variability there is in, um, in terms of um, how um, that general uh, pictorial appearance of, uh, of an object, in this case of uh, a horse, changes. You may also develop some kind of intuition if you look at these pictures with respect to some um, viewpoints, um, let's say the side or the um, front side of an object being easier to, um, to recognize than others. So for instance, if you look at the top or the back of a horse, um, those may be viewpoints that um, do not necessarily facilitate um, efficient uh, object recognition. 
So viewpoint is an um, incredible source of variability in the appearance of an object. And um, by way of um, template um, theory, we would have to assume that for every single um, viewpoint, we would have a stored representation, a template of that which leads to a considerable increase in the um, amount of resources that visual memory needs to provide for us. So we no longer have just a one or two or three um, templates for an object. We have many, many different um, templates associated with all the different viewpoints um, in which we can um, encounter a, uh, an object. Okay, so make, that makes recognition um, quite, quite difficult. Um, and unfortunately, again, this is not the whole story because size and position also contribute tremendously to um, um, variability in appearance. It's not the case that we can just walk around an object, but we can also um, come closer to it or move further away from it. If we move closer, the size of the object uh, projecting on our um, retinas um, is bigger. If we depart, if we move away from an object, the size of the object becomes smaller. So for instance, if you look at the car in traffic from afar, the, uh, the size of the object appears to be small. But if that car comes closer to you, the size of the object is, uh, appears to be larger. Um, and also the position within which we can recognize an object matters a lot as well. We learn that if you view something um, within one side of your um, visual field um, that might project to um, a certain patch of cortex, um, while if you view it in another part um, of the visual field that may be projected in a different part of your visual cortex. How does the brain um, know that these different objects, or rather these different projections um, of an object on different patches of um, a visual cortex correspond to the same object. Another problem is that of lighting. We know that um, the medium through which um, vision is enabled and um, hence um, object recognition is light. However, the precise image that an object projects um, on, a, on, a, on our retinas can change tremendously as a function of, uh, of lighting. So in dim lighting, the appearance of an object may look like this or like that. But uh, we, if, the, if the light is quite bright, then um, the image overall is quite different. And it's not just about the intensity um, or the color. Um, but also the direction from which lighting um, approaches an object. So for instance, you can see that the shadow that um, is cast upon a face is quite different here um, from, um, from what happens here or here. So if the light um, is coming to the object from the top or from the right or from the, or from the uh, left, the specific um, image that results um, um, from, um, from this interaction between the surface of an object, um, its shape and the incoming light um, is quite different. So we see that viewpoint, size, position, lighting all contribute to, to make the appearance of an object highly variable. So since this only um, scratches the surface of the many factors that impact the appearance of an object, um, this tends to render um, the appeal to um, templates um, quite um, uns unsatisfactory, right? Um, because it seems quite impossible that we have stored representations of every possible instance um, of an object from every viewpoint, for every possible lighting, um, for every size, and so on and so forth. Furthermore, somebody should have taught us somehow that all these objects that um, um, can be so different in appearance can match onto a, um, onto a simple representation, be that a cup of coffee, um, or, uh, or the letter G. Okay, so then how do we deal with that, right? If templates are not enough, 
then perhaps what we do is appeal to features. Perhaps the way in which we deal with object constancy, the, uh, the ability to process um, different appearances of an object as the same object with the same identity, um, by appealing to, to a vocabulary of visual features. Um, and again, we appeal to letters because it makes a lot more sense to, to deal with um, um, with um, here um, as a way of, uh, of explaining uh, featural-based recognition. If you look at the letter of T, for instance, you can easily decompose it um, into a set of features. For instance, um, you have a junction of um, two different lines um, at 90 degrees, um, and you also have a horizontal top. What you don't have in a letter T is an oblique line. Um, you also don't have any kind of curvature. So just by decomposing the letters of the alphabet into a set of features and by being able to identify what the um, present, what the current features are, um, you might be able to tell that this is the letter T, for instance, and it is not R or P or Q or O or anything else. So by analyzing the features and the relative configuration um, present within a um, um, visual symbol, you may be able to tell that this is the letter T. And the same for any other letter. Okay, so maybe this is how we handle viewpoint um, invariance and any of the other issues. Because presumably the angle between these two lines doesn't really change um, with uh, orienting the letter T in different positions, right? And um, the horizontal tops tends to stay there most of the time when we um, look at the letter T. So perhaps this is how we solve also viewpoint invariance, right? The idea that an invariant of viewpoint, um, the appearance of an object can be matched onto a single identity. And this is precisely the um, idea, the, the fundamental thinking be behind one of the most um, influential, uh, one of the most seminal theories in, um, in um, psychology, in the study of perception. Um, it's called recognition by components, um, and it is due to um, um, Irving Biederman. It was highly popular in the 80s and the 90s, and it shaped um, a lot the way in which we think about uh, object recognition. Now, when we talked about letters, um, we looked at the possibility of using um, lines uh, with different orientations and with different types of junctions, but clearly that's not sufficient when we talk about um, actual objects in the real world, right? And not just letters printed on a sheet of paper or on a computer screen. What happens, for instance, when we look at the human body, right? Um, well, what Biederman suggested is that uh, we rely on a vocabulary of features somewhat more complex than the lines that might um, enable us to perform a letter recognition, but not so different in, uh, in spirit. He called these um, objects um, geons um, from generalized cones, and he viewed them um, very much as simple volumes that are highly distinctive from, um, from each other and critically they are view invariant in that irrespective of what viewpoint you look at them they're easily recognizable um, and they can be easily assimilated to a specific identity. So for instance some of um, some geons might look like a brick, some of them might look like uh, cylinders, um, some of them might look like a um, cone or a section of a cone and so on and so forth. Um, he identified about three dozen such, um, such geons and he generated them by varying um, some simple geometrical properties. So for instance, some of them are curved while some of them are straight, some of them taper off while some of them maintain um, the same size of a cross section like a cylinder. The idea is that these are very simple geometrical properties um, and it makes them highly um, distinguishable from, um, from each other, right? So it's irrespective, oh, 
mostly uh, independent of what viewpoint you look at um, let's say a um, cylinder versus a, a cone you should be able to distinguish those two and if you look at a curved geon versus one with straight um, lines again they are very discriminable um, from uh, from each other okay so so far he postulated somehow that we have this vocabulary of um, geometric primitives of basic volume 3d um, features then what he argued is that most objects out there in the real world can be decomposed can be analyzed into such geons so for instance if you look at the human body you have the trunk which can be thought of as a cylinder and then you have a smaller cylinder on top of it which can uh, approximate the human head and then you have um, arms and forearms and hands and so on and so forth so you can go through every other body part um, and assimilate it to a configuration of geons and here comes the second uh, part of that theory it's not just a set of of geons that serve to identify an object but also their relative um, configuration so for instance both a cup and a pail rely on the same two geons but um, for a cup the um, one of the geons is placed onto the side uh, of the other while in the case of a pail the relative positioning changes in that the the um, handle um, geon in this case is placed on on top and not on the side of the other geon um, and here are just a few um, common examples of, of objects that can be decomposed can be analyzed into a collection of, uh, of geons okay so this was Biderman's suggestion we rely on a vocabulary of um, features um, of volumetric features for the purpose of object recognition in the same way in which let's say um, recognizing words relies on recognizing letters and recognizing letters rec um, relies on recognizing a set of um, simple um, visual features such as lines and um, straight or curved the problem with that um, is that geons turned out not to be as view um, independent as Biderman suggested um, in one of the studies that um, really managed to land a, um, a blow to this theory um, Michael Tarr and colleagues um, at the end of the 90s show that it's not as easy um, to to assimilate different um, viewpoints of a, of a geon to a single identity if you vary the, um, the viewpoint so what they did more precisely was to consider um, a whole bunch of geons and to look at what happens if you take one of them for instance and you vary its viewpoint so you can present it um, in the same um, uh, position as, as before with the same viewpoint or you can vary its viewpoint a bit or a bit more and what he found um, was that the larger the viewpoint difference between two occurrences of the same geon the longer it took um, human participants to um, identify correctly um, that those two instances of the same geon represented the same geon so for instance if you present the same geon with the same orientation twice in a row participants should um, should be relatively quick to identify that as the same geon but if you present a second occurrence of the same geon uh, with a, a viewpoint difference of 45 degrees then participants take a bit longer and if you increase that viewpoint even more let's say 90 degrees right um, then the response time increases even more so now this doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense if geons are truly viewpoint independent and if geons are not um, viewpoint um, independent then um, that sabotages uh, pretty much the entire theory that they support viewpoint independence Biderman tried to solve object constancy 
the viewpoint independence of uh, object recognition by assuming that it relies on um, view independent geons. However, this turns out not to be um, correct. And um, this was just one of a series of studies that tried to uh, lay out the difficulties that the geon theory had for um, explaining, for accounting object recognition. However, at this point, I think it's useful to turn to the neural evidence, right? We already acknowledged uh, that the brain has um, quite a tremendous amount of resources dedicated to the problem of uh, object recognition, right? And presumably, this facilitates also um, dealing with the orientation matter, solving viewpoint independence. So what do different um, neuroscience tools have to offer um, with the purpose of um, addressing this um, debate in the, in the earlier days of um, theorizing uh, about object recognition? How does the brain tell us that these two different viewpoints, these two different images of the same object actually have to be matched with the very same object. And to answer that question, uh, we're going to have to take a quick detour through a very important technique in um, fMRI and, uh, and not only. Um, it is known as um, repetition suppression. Uh, in the context of fMRI research, it is also known as fMRI adaptation. And it relies on a very robust effect. Um, a reduction in the amount of um, neural activity associated with repeated presentations of the same object. So for instance, if you see this object once, an umbrella, an entire population of neurons is activated by it. But the second time you view that object, let's say a few seconds later, um, then we notice a marked reduction in the amount of um, neural activity associated with viewing that object. Presumably because um, fewer neurons um, are involved in that or because um, neurons are activated um, a bit less um, by the second presentation of an, of an object. And the third time you see that object, um, you might see an even further decrease um, in the neural activation as recorded, for instance, by, uh, by fMRI. So again, the first time you look at an object, let's call that a novel uh, presentation, the um, visual cortex, or particular patch of the visual cortex, um, it, it exhibits um, considerable um, levels of activation. Um, but the second time uh, you repeat that uh, the presentation of that stimulus of the very same object, you see a reduction in the amount of neural activity. Um, and this is contrasted with a fixation condition, uh, which in many cases can function as a very basic, uh, an incomplete but unnecessary control, where participants typically stare at a blank screen or at a simple um, um, visual symbols such as a dot or a plus sign um, in the middle of, um, of a otherwise uh, blank screen. So relative to that fixation condition, we see um, considerable activation when an image is presented, but reduced activation the second time um, an image is presented. Why might that happen? There's still quite a, quite a bit of discussion in, um, in the field with respect to the precise mechanism that underlies repetition suppression. Uh, but one general hypothesis that um, seems to carry um, a lot of um, um, apparent validity is that um, we have fewer neurons uh, or a reduced neural population involved in the, in the um, multiple presentations of the same object because we exhibit increased efficiency in the representation of an object. So the first time we try to make sense of this umbrella, we don't really know what counts and what doesn't count um, in its uh, appearance to be able to identify it. But once uh, we have already seen that object, perhaps we don't need to represent uh, with um, 
um, equal efficiency all its um, um, let's say all its features right perhaps we only need to key on on the specific visual features that uh, enable us to recognize the umbrella perhaps the handle uh, perhaps the appearance of the top um, and then the third time if we are an object um, perhaps we need even less visual information and hence um, an even um, less um, populous um, collection of neurons to, to uh, be able to identify that as, uh, as an umbrella. And you might wonder there what happens if we present this object a fourth time and a fifth time and a sixth time and so on and so forth. Well, eventually the effect um, tapers off. Eventually you're going to um, reach some level of reduced neural representation that stays at that level. So we're never going to be able to present an object enough times that uh, we reach um, eventually the level of fixation. There's always going to be some amount of um, neural activity associated with the presentation of an event. It's just the case that um, there is a marked reduction, especially when we moved on from the first to the second presentation of an uh, object. Okay, so um, how does actually the fMRI evidence um, look for this? And um, in the 90s, it was clearly established that uh, when you look at a novel object, um, there's plenty of visual activity um, recorded, um, imaged within the occipital temporal cortex, right? You can see that here. And not only, um, you can still find um, activity also within the parietal and the frontal cortex. Uh, but by and large, you get um, loads of um, activation using fMRI. Um, within the um, uh, occipital and temporal cortex. And the very same regions tend to come online when you view the very same image of an object a second time in a row. Yet, there is a decrease in the amount of activation at the level of those regions. So if instead of subtraction, subtracting the um, neural activity uh, image for novel or repeated versus fix the fixation condition uh, with novel minus repeated you can see that some parts of um, the occipitotemporal cortex um, were much more active for novel than for repeated presentations of the of the same object okay so now that we have discussed this now that we have seen how repetition can suppress or reduce the amount of neural activity for um, um, for a given um, stimulus. What does that have to tell us about um, viewpoint um, invariance and how the brain solves the problem of object constancy? Well, let's go through a uh, brief cartoon-like explanation of what could happen here. Let's say that we have two pictures of the same object. We present the first one first, uh, and we present the very same uh, picture a second time in a row. Then what happens is repetition suppression, as we just discussed. The first time we view that picture, the brain activity reaches a certain level for a given cortical area. Um, the next time we present this picture, a second, uh, few seconds later, we see a marked reduction in the level of brain activity for that specific cortical region. Okay, but the question now becomes what happens if we present two different views of the same object and uh, in a row and we record um, the bold signal, the fMRI signal within the same cortical area? Well, if we have different populations of neurons supporting different um, visual representations, one for picture one, one for picture two, corresponding to two different viewpoints, then the brain activity should stay very much um, at the same level, right? Um, you have one viewpoint that activates um, a certain neural population and then a second of different viewpoint that activates a different um, um, neural population. So you should see comparable levels of um, neural activity, no repetition suppression. However, if the representation is the same, if the brain relies on the same um, 
let's say, geon-based um, viewpoint invariant of an object, then the second time we view a, in an image of that, um, of that object oriented differently, then the same neural population has to come online. But it's already been active, and so the second time it comes online, um, it should be more efficient. It should um, activate that neural population less strongly, and we should be able to see um, repetition suppression. So just to recap here, if we view two images in a row, we should see um, image. Um, we should see repetition suppression. If we view two different um, orientations of the same object in the context of a um, different representations for different viewpoints, there should be no repetition suppression. But if the brain somehow deploys um, view invariant neural representations relying on the same population of um, neural cells to represent an object irrespective of viewpoint, we should be able to see viewpoint invariance. To, to see repetition suppression. Okay, so which one are, does um, which one of these two versions B or C turns out to be to be true? And um, this has been um, tested in a series of studies. Uh, perhaps one of the earliest um, from two thousand and two um, looked at what happens within the left and right fusiform area. This is an area that spans. Um, parts of both uh, occipital and um, temporal cortex, and it is well known from previous work to be involved in object recognition. So whenever you try to identify uh, an object, for instance, um, the, the fusiform uh, cortex tends to, uh, to come online. Well, uh, what they did in that study was to look at real objects such as um, um, teapots and chairs and old school phones, and they viewed, um, they asked participants to view them um, from the same viewpoint, so the same image shown twice in a row, or from different views. Um, they also played with size, but uh, we're not going to discuss that um, here. And as expected, when viewing the same object um, with the same view twice in a row, um, led to a um, to repetition suppression um, within the left fusiform area. Interestingly enough, then, uh, when showing the same object with different views also led to repetition suppression. Hence, the evidence seems to favor uh, for this cortical area um, view invariant um, representations per uh, our earlier discussion. However, though, when looking at the right fusiform area, while um, repetition suppression was found, as expected, for same view, um, it was not also present in the case of different views, right? So, when you're seeing new objects or different viewpoints of the um, same object, the um, level of activation was very much um, the same or comparable. Hence, um, there is evidence that the right fusiform area appears to encode different uh, visual representations for different viewpoints of the same object. So it's not just the case that we encode different um, representations for different objects, but also multiple representations of the same object depending on, um, on its viewpoint. Um, and again, this is just uh, one of the um, early studies. Um, the, the story became even more complex um, over the last uh, two um, decades. Uh, but um, what seems to stay the same across um, these different studies is the conclusion that different cortical areas exhibit different levels of viewpoint invariance. Some of them um, are pretty good at handling invariants with, uh, with the same neural population, while other areas appear to rely heavily on a multitude of um, distinct visual representations, different neural representations to different um, viewpoints. So different parts of the um, visual um, cortex, different approaches um, in how they handle object constancy.
As a caveat though, uh, one thing that should be clear here is that such results do not necessarily support um, a specific account of featural organization. Um, to be clear, the fact that the left fusiform area uh, appears to encode um, view invariant representations is not necessarily evidence for a geon based account. The geon-based account is a classical um, theory in, um, in psychology um, and in uh, cognitive neuroscience. However, it is not the only one. Um, many other potential candidates for the role of volume-based features um, have been proposed. So it could be any one of those um, uh, alternative types of uh, volumetric features or some that probably we haven't um, encountered or um, discovered so far. So again, these results just show that some cortical regions uh, are likely to involve um, some volumetric uh, primitives, some volumetric features, but they do not necessarily speak to their identity. Okay, uh, so moving on, we already introduced the idea that um, fusiform cortex is involved in uh, object recognition. So perhaps it behooves us at this point to move to a broader uh, description of, um, of the um, way in which uh, our brains facilitate um, object recognition. And the fundamental distinction um, in the study of um, visual processing since the early 80s up to now um, is the distinction between a ventral stream, a ventral pathway, versus a dorsal stream or a dorsal pathway, uh, whose functionalities are quite different from each other. A ventral stream pathway, which starts in area V1 and moves on a posterior to anterior axis through the temporal lobe, is believed to support object recognition. It's a what pathway. It informs us um, regarding the identity of, uh, of an object. And it makes sense because we already know that the temporal lobe encompasses um, certain structures which are critical for memory, including visual memory. Hence, if the job of object recognition is to link a new visual experience with previous visual information, it only makes sense that um, the collection of cortical areas that support uh, object recognition should be in the proximity of um, temporal areas for um, storing visual memories. Okay, so we have a progression of cortical areas moving from V1 um, through the inferior temporal lobe all the way to the uh, tip of the temporal lobe, the um, uh, anterior part of the temporal lobe. Okay, so this is what supports um, object recognition. In contrast to that, we have a dorsal pathway, which also starts in V1, but uh, moves up through the uh, parietal um, cortex, whose job appears to be um, providing information about the where and the how, where things are in space and how should we be able to manipulate them uh, based on visual information. So in that sense, the dorsal stream is um, critical for visual motor integration. Um, whenever you are trying to pick up a cup of coffee um, on your table, let's say, um, it is not critical that you identify that as a cup of coffee, right? That would be the job of the ventral stream. But the ability to, to um, grab the cup of coffee correctly so you can lift it up applying the right amount of force to lift it up um, is it's something that the dorsal stream um, facilitates. Now there's a lot of crosstalk between between these two pathways because obviously being able to relate um, information about the where can benefit the how and vice versa, right? And there's been plenty of evidence over the last decade or so to show how fundamental that crosstalk is. However, by and large, the division uh, between a um, ventral pathway uh, for object recognition and a dorsal pathway um, facilitating visual motor integration um, is still widely accepted and, uh, and valid. And we're going to spend a lot uh, more time uh, later in the course um, talking about the dorsal stream. However, given the focus on uh, 
object recognition for the present lecture. Um, this is, uh, is the pathway that we will be um, dedicating um, the rest of the lecture um, to. Um, okay. So then what's the evidence for these two pathways? Um, and since the 80s, when um, lesion studies in animals have been fundamental in uh, providing the, um, the initial um, evidence for them, uh, a lot of neuroimaging research has been um, conducted um, in animals and in humans. For instance, uh, here is a, um, an early pet study from the mid-90s by um, Alex, uh, Martin and colleagues at the National Institutes of Health. Um, that looked at um, the areas of um, visual cortex that are activated by nonsense objects, noise patterns, and meaningful objects. So, for instance, um, one um, specific um, manipulation in this study was to ask participants to view uh, nonsensical objects, so things that look like an object, but it's something that you probably have never encountered uh, before, um, and also look at noise patterns, such as those shown um, here. And then by using the subtraction technique, um, you can isolate the areas that are much more active in response to nonsense objects than to noise. And expectedly, they, uh, they found that areas of the ventral cortex, including the occipital cortex and the ventral temporal lobe, um, seem to exhibit that property, seem to support uh, the visual processing of nonsense objects, uh, much more so than uh, noise uh, patterns. However, the critical um, distinction here, the critical piece of analysis, is uh, by trying to isolate what happens when we view meaningful objects versus nonsensical objects. So for instance, what's specific to, to viewing and recognizing a saw as a saw or a, a bear as a bear, right? So when you perform this subtraction, uh, what you find is a, a host of um, cortical areas that span um, the medial occipital lobe uh, as well as uh, medial um, temporal areas. And the reason this is interesting is because medial temporal areas are believed to support uh, memory, right, visual memory. So in this sense, um, the collection of um, areas believed to support uh, visual um, processing and visual memory is significant. Uh, it provides evidence for um, um, the rationale of a uh, ventral pathway for object recognition, one that links visual experiences, new visual experiences, with past information uh, about the identity of, uh, of visual objects. Okay, so this was the, the mid-90s, and um, as you guys know by now, um, by the late 90s, the beginning of the 2000s, fMRI really um, um, became uh, popular. So people started to look then not just into um, how objects activate different parts of the um, ventral cortex, but also things like faces and places um, and body parts um, and so on and so forth. And what they found is an entire array of cortical areas that um, seem to be more active in response to objects, uh, and those are shown here in, um, um, in orange. Some are more um, active for faces, and those are shown in pink here, and some are more active for places, as shown in green here. Um, now, for um, clarity's sake, uh, what I should mention here is that um, this is a particular way of um, displaying um, information uh, about uh, cortical activation from uh, fMRI. So if you look at this carefully, it doesn't really look like a human brain, right? A lot of the, the structure, the wrinkly structure, for instance, has been lost here. Uh, and the shape does not necessarily resemble that of a human um, adult brain either. And the reason for that is because whenever we looked at slices, 
um, delivered by uh, structural um, MRI, uh, we have to navigate through multiple ones to try to get a better picture of what's going on. So an alternative way of visualizing that information is to use image processing software that inflates the brain like a balloon uh, and then it allows us to look at the same time um, at a much uh, at a, at a broader picture. Um, and um, some conventions are in place um, to allow the interpretation of such uh, images. So for instance, the salsi are shown here in darker gray colors and the dry rye are shown in uh, brighter gray colors in lighter shades of, uh, of uh, gray. So um, over time, this way of displaying information has become quite um, common and it is likely that uh, we'll uh, encounter it um, more and more often over the over the course of the next um, few lectures. Okay, um, so that aside, what we view here is a ventral perspective of, uh, of the human brain um, and the areas that are believed to be critical for the recognition of objects and faces and places. So here we have a ventral view and here we can also see a lateral view of the uh, lateral uh, occipital cortex and the posterior fusiform sulcus, um, which are believed to support um, object recognition. To summarize, the ventral stream appears to be heavily involved in the visual processing of different categories of objects. And not just that, but um, it appears to be differentially sensitive to objects versus faces versus places um, in the sense that different parts of the ventral stream uh, appears to support um, predominantly one category of objects versus the others. Uh, so to better appreciate um, this, um, the significance of this fact, let's take one step back to a study published in 1997 by Nancy Canvisha and colleagues at um, MIT. Um, and this fMRI study builds upon um, previous uh, PET results um, from the 90s, as well as um, a certain intuition as to the um, importance of faces um, for, um, for our daily lives and the importance of being able to recognize faces uh, efficiently for our social lives. Being able to distinguish friend um, from foe, being able to tell apart different um, friends and acquaintances, being able to read the emotional of expression of, uh, of someone, whether known or um, um, unknown, um, is, is critical for, uh, for our ability to um, interact with each other and, and function um, um, in a um, satisfactory manner uh, in um, social settings. Hence, it makes sense to assume that the brain might have dedicated some specific circuitry to solving that uh, problem. Uh, and it is indeed a problem because faces are highly similar to each other. And that's not something that you particularly pay a lot of attention to nowadays. But if you consider the variability in the structure of human faces, um, it is not as... Um, as um, um, a variable as um, as one might think, right? So uh, the configuration of a human face is more or less always the same in terms of the placement of the eyes and the nose and the mouth. So is it really the case that um, the brain dedicates some specific cortical area to, to processing faces? And that's exactly what the study looked uh, into. Um, Canvisha and colleagues exposed participants to um, images of faces and images of objects and then they used the subtraction method to look at um, possible cortical areas that are a lot more active for faces than for objects and they did indeed manage to find this part of the fusiform cortex um, reliably and robustly across 12 individuals uh, which showed um, activation for both faces and objects, but more or less um, it exhibited twice as much activation for faces relative to, to objects. Now, this area was found bilaterally, both within the right and left hemisphere, but um, it was more uh, robustly found in the right hemisphere. And then that's a fact that we will uh, touch upon um, again later. <laughs> 
she also proceeded to discount um, alternative hypotheses. So for instance, she found that this is not uh, an area that only activates for human faces, but also for animal faces or uh, cartoon faces. She showed that um, it activates not just for familiar faces, but also for unfamiliar faces and so on uh, and uh, so um, so forth. Um, and based upon um, this um, um, e extensive um, exploration, she decided to call this area the fusiform face area as an indication uh, and as a note that this area is uh, most likely a module, a um, dedicated uh, part of um, ventral cortex um, that has the task of supporting face recognition. However, no matter how thorough you think you are at um, ruling out uh, alternative um, hypotheses, um, it's always the case, uh, or most of the time the case, that um, some possible explanations have been left out. And um, Isabel Gautier and uh, Michael Tarr in the late 90s explored one such um, hypothesis. Uh, what they pointed out is that um, faces um, are very special in the sense that they require a certain type of, uh, of expertise. And um, this is perceptual expertise, it's visual expertise, it's not the typical theoretical expertise that uh, we typically talk about. So when we talk about expertise here, it's, um, it's the ability to make very fine um, distinctions between um, uh, highly similar um, items of a category of um, stimuli. And we're all experts of faces. We're able to tell uh, faces uh, apart um, from a very early age, right? Um, but what happens if we consider alternative types of expertise? So let's say some people have visual expertise with, uh, with cars. They are able to tell apart different models of classic cars from the 70s. And some people are bird experts. Um, they can tell um, very similar uh, classes of birds from, uh, from each other. So for instance, they can distinguish different um, gulls and um, shorebirds from each other, uh, which most of us would not be able to do, right? So these are all different types of visual expertise. And the question is, is it really the case that the fusiform face area, the FFA, um, to use the uh, commonly known abbreviation, um, is specific for faces, or is it a more general area uh, dedicated to different types of expertise? And um, to answer this question, what uh, Gautier and Tara did was to create a um, set of um, artificial stimuli that are highly similar to each other and try to mimic in this structure the characteristics of human faces in that um, different types of such stimuli, which they called gribbles, um, can be somewhat different from each other. But uh, based upon their organization um, in families, you can have different individuals from the same family which are highly, highly similar to each other. And you would only be able to tell apart um, such individuals and to assign names to them uh, with a considerable amount of training. And that's exactly what they did. Um, they proceeded to train participants uh, across six sessions, uh, across multiple days, um, until they were um, quite good at discriminating not just different families of gribbles from each other, but also different individuals from the same family of, of gribbles. And the question was, what happens over the course of training? Uh, when you're just starting your, uh, your um, visual training with gribbles, expectedly in these participants uh, when you put them in the scanner you find reliable activation within the FFA in response to faces but nothing or very little if you look at activation when these participants uh, look at gribbles within the FFA. However um, after four to six sessions what you find is that activation appears to emerge in response to gribbles at the location of the um, FFA. Um, and if you try to quantify the amount of activation within the FFA, 
um, for Gribbles versus Faces, you see that the initial difference starts to disappear. So at the very beginning, during sessions one and two, uh, participants activate um, this area a lot more for faces than for gribbles. But um, during sessions five to six, um, the difference is no longer statistically significant, right? So you see roughly comparable levels of activation for um, faces and for gribbles within what we call gribble experts. So people who have undergone um, at least five to six hours of uh, visual expertise with uh, gribble um, recognition. Okay, so then um, is this something that only happens with um, this artificial class of stimuli? Some people asked. Perhaps um, this happens because gribbles um, resemble more or less the structure of, hum of a human body. All right. Um, most noticeably, they have something that we can label as uh, as the head. Right. So then you can think of the overall configuration and positioning and size of various appendages of the head as the structure of a face. So is this still really about expertise is or is it something that um, takes advantage of one's ability? the um, process faces and um, extrapolate it to a new class of stimuli which are also treated more or less like faces. So to answer that question, in a uh, follow-up study, um, they looked at actual um, real-world expertise. So if you look at um, cars or birds, you might be less tempted to say that um, this expertise builds upon uh, face um, processing, right? So if you look at the body of a bird, it doesn't really appear to have much similarity to the uh, appearance of a face, for instance. And what they also found uh, was that um, in car experts, the FFA seemed to play a role. And in bird experts, um, the FFA seemed to play a role. But um, obviously, the um, car um, expertise did not really seem to um, matter too much in bird experts. Um, and conversely, um, bird expertise uh, did not really need to, uh, uh, did not seem to, to matter too much uh, um, in the case of um, car experts. So in other words, if you present birds to a car expert, um, this category of stimuli does not seem to activate the FFA. Okay, so um, this provided some uh, important challenge for um, the main um, theory regarding the um, relevance of the FFA in um, face processing. And this, this led to a um, debate that raged on for um, over a decade um, and um, some studies are still debating um, the uh, possible explanation and uh, functional role of what we still call the FFA nowadays um, in terms of expertise versus face category specific um, activation and, uh, and processing. Okay, and this takes us to the uh, midpoint um, of the um, lecture. So feel free to take a break if you uh, wish to do so. Otherwise, we'll uh, press on with a uh, discussion of uh, impairments in uh, object recognition. And um, given um, our previous um, topic of conversation, it only makes sense to start with prosopagnosia, a selective or relatively selective deficit in uh, face recognition. And this can occur uh, because of a brain injury, let's say a stroke, or it can be something um, which is congenital or uh, developmental. Okay, so to be more specific, what is prosopagnosia? Well, it is a visual deficit whose hallmark is the inability or the reduced ability in um, discriminating faces of uh, different people and um, being able to um, associate faces with specific identities. Um, a person with uh, prosopagnosia can do just fine in uh, detecting the presence of a face, let's say in a uh, picture or in um, their environment, but they have difficulty telling who that person e be is, be that a, um, a parent, a friend, an acquaintance, 
or even themselves when uh, when looking at uh, at their own uh, um, faces in uh, in the mirror. Um, individuals with prosopagnosia might also have difficulty um, recognizing or um, imagining the faces uh, of uh, of people while while dreaming, which is quite striking. Um, despite the fact that many other visual abilities are left intact. Um, the ability to, to process or to recognize objects, um, the ability to um, perceive even the external um, features of the face, such as someone's hair style or ears or the overall shape of the face. Sometimes um, even the internal um, features of the face, such as the eyes and the nose and the mouth, are processed just fine. It's the inability to put these features together into a coherent whole, which is uh, often the, uh, the hallmark of uh, prosopagnosia. And there are many, many descriptions out there of what uh, the phenomenology of prosopagnosia is, the subjective uh, visual experience associated with it. Um, some people just uh, describe features floating in space. Some mention a lack of distinctiveness um, of a face relative to another. Um, others, in some other cases, um, describe um, features melting uh, rather than uh, being stable. Um, and um, this only scratches the surface of um, how bizarre uh, and at the same time interesting from, uh, from a neuroscience standpoint uh, prosopagnosia is. Um, from a social standpoint though, prosopagnosia can be um, quite harming. Um, while uh, such individuals can rely on external features, someone's haircut or someone's um, style of um, dressing themselves uh, or someone's um, gait, someone's walk, uh, or someone's voice to identify them. Um, you can imagine that the ability to identify or spot someone in a, in a crowd is, um, is quite um, uh, lacking. Also, they may not be uh, doing so well in um, specific jobs. So let's say someone with prosopagnosia will never be a security guard for that matter. And this is um, um, all the more uh, noticeable in that um, some estimates um, place the numbers or the percentage of individuals with congenital uh, or developmental uh, prosopagnosia as high as 2% um, of, uh, of the population. Okay, so this is one specific type of impairment if, when, which often occurs as a result of damage to the FFA but also as a result of um, some unknown or um, currently hotly disputed um, neural mechanism that um, is um, impaired in individuals with uh, uh, congenital and developmental prosopagnosia. However, this is just one type of um, agnosia. And by agnosia, we mean a more general um, impairment in object recognition. And uh, agnosia comes in, um, in, come in very different um, subtypes and um, flavors. Uh, one which is particularly interesting to discuss is that of uh, associative visual agnosia. Um, someone with associative visual agnosia um, can do quite well at uh, writing, uh, drawing things from memory, such as a pair of glasses or a hammer, at copying things uh, on a sheet of paper, so let's say a uh, key or a bird or a pig, they can do quite well at describing the shape of an object that they see. So for instance, upon looking at the key, they can say that um, one part of the object is more elongated, while the other one is broader and it has a hole um, somewhere at the top. Perhaps more interestingly, they can even identify the object um, when listening um, to the sound it makes um, or uh, upon touching it. And they can um, use those, can manipulate those objects uh, quite well. So for instance, using a key to unlock uh, a door. However, the ability to identify those objects seems to be um, impaired. And this is quite striking in that um, while you're able to process the shape and the color and the texture of an object, while you still have the memory 
uh, of what that object might be while um, you're able to recognize it quite fine using um, other um, sensory modalities audition and um, the, the tactile stimulation it is specifically the ability to recognize objects using visual perception that seems to be impaired so um, based on such patterns of results um, the most likely explanation is that the link between perception and memory has been um, um, has been impaired um, is no longer functional and this makes sense in that perception seems to be okay so the perception of shape and color and memory um, still seems to be um, reliable in this individual since clearly they can um, access uh, what a pair of glasses or a hammer should look like. It is just the um, ability to transition from a visual experience to the memory of an object um, that seems to not work properly. Okay, so this is associative visual agnosia in that um, it seems to target the association between visual perception and visual memory. Um, and um, while the focus of our discussion um, today is visual object recognition. We should mention, nevertheless, that agnosia occurs in other um, sensory modalities. So, for instance, um, someone um, can do quite well at visual object recognition, but if suffering from auditory agnosia, um, they might not be able to, um, to process the identity of an object after listening to the sound it makes, right? Let's say uh, a bird. Um, they might not be able to um, uh, process the identity or recognize an object um, upon touching it if they suffer from um, astereognosis. Um, and this is again quite striking in that um, visual recognition can be fine, auditory recognition can be fine, um, tactile sensation can be fine, and many aspects of tactile um, perceptual processing can be fine, but the link between um, tactile um, perception and um, tactile memory can be impaired. Okay, so this is what happens in associative agnosias. However, um, it is often the case that um, the impairment uh, is a more profound uh, and more severe, uh, especially in the presence of a larger um, um, brain damage. And uh, in this case, um, individuals with what we call apperceptive visual agnosia um, have difficulty even copying the shapes of different objects on a sheet of paper. So, for instance, when presenting with an object or with a geometrical shape such as this, the result might be something like this. Uh, and uh, when shown, um, let's say, with the shape of a cube, the result may be this which also speaks to the inability to process the 3D shape, um, the perspective-based um, um, characteristics of an, uh, of an object. Um, okay, so um, then how much deeper um, is the deficit in these individuals? Well, um, object recognition is quite peculiar in individuals with perceptive visual agnosia in that if a of an object is presented from a very typical orientation, um, someone with apperceptive agnosia might still be able to recognize it. But if that object is presented from a relatively uncommon position, um, then the deficit is quite no noticeable and quite severe. So if we go back to um, our discussion about viewpoints, um, you might remember that looking at the horse from a side view or from a three-quarter view um, is quite common. Uh, but viewing a um, horse from above um, or from, um, from behind, it's a bit less common. So in an individual with apperceptive visual agnosia, we expect that um, recognizing the horse from a side view may be um, almost comparable to what you see in a normal, uh, um, in an individual with normal um, recognition abilities, but uh, identifying a horse from, um, from the back, um, from the top, is severely impaired. Okay, so um, this again just scratches the surface of the many, many different types of um, agnosias and the relationship uh, between um, different types of agnosias, which is also quite uh, hotly debated in the field, and it has been so 
for, um, for several decades in some cases. But let's speak to something um, related and um, equally interesting. And that is what happens to object recognition when not just the link between perception and memory is impaired or when perception is impaired. Let's see what happens when sensation is actually no longer um, doing its job properly. Um, and as an instance, let's see what happens in the congenitally blind. Are they still able to, to recognize objects and using what neural mechanisms, what neural resources? Um, and a number of studies over the last two decades have provided some very interesting insights as to what happens in such individuals. Um, if you look at um, brain scans of sighted individuals when engaged in a tactile or visual exploration of, let's say, um, a face or a uh, bottle of water or a shoe, um, there is some overlap in the neural resources that um, these different types of um, uh, modalities, of, um, of sensory modalities, um, activate uh, both the motor cortex and the visual cortex. Um, so, for instance, um, both tactile and visual stimulation using a common set of objects uh, leads to overlap uh, within the um, IT, within the uh, inferotemporal cortex. However, by and large, the patterns that we see for tactile versus visual stimulation are quite different. So, as you might expect, um, when sighted individuals um, view faces and bottles, um, there is plenty of activation within the, the um, inferotemporal cortex, within the uh, ventral um, pathway. And um, conversely, um, there is plenty of activation within the motor cortex when they um, use tactile exploration to identify an object. Um, however, the interesting point is that in blind subjects, when um, upon exploring um, the, uh, the shape um, and trying to recognize the identity of an uh, object um, by using tactile stimulation, it is the IT, it is a um, large swath of um, ventral um, temporal um, lobe that comes into play. Um, and the placement and the size of the activation that we find within the uh, inferotemporal cortex is um, surprisingly comparable to what we see when sighted individuals engage in visual exploration and recognition of an object which um, really poses an interesting question. Is the ventral uh, pathway really for visual object recognition or is it designed for object recognition more generally? Um, and it's been proposed in the field that um, actually the V ventral um, stream is recruited for visual object recognition simply because vision is in most uh, people our dominant sense. But um, plasticity um, as well as the overall design, um, let's say um, the general patterns of um, connectivity and the, um, the architecture of, um, of uh, the um, neural resources uh, present within uh, the human brain allows um, the ventral um, cortex, the ventral temporal lobe, to support object recognition more generally um, using um, tactile stimulation or um, auditory um, cues for the purpose of uh, object recognition. Okay, at this stage, um, it's um, probably a good time to um, reorient um, our discussion into a slightly different direction. Um, so what I'm going to do is point to a potential limitation to much of the work that uh, we had the occasion to look at um, so far. Uh, whenever we discuss, uh, for instance, object recognition in the congenitally blind, um, we point it to a large swath of um, ventral um, cortex, right, which is um, um, more or less comparable um, in its um, location and size in sighted individuals and blind uh, participants as well. Um, 
And similarly, when we talked about uh, phase uh, processing, we pointed to the role of the FFA, which is its um, own uh, batch of cortex within the fusiform cortex. Um, and then um, if we had the opportunity to talk about um, things like um, scene recognition or word recognition, we would have mentioned as well specific parts of, um, of um, ventral um, temporal cortex, uh, which are um, responsible for those um, categories. Um, however, this seems to um, not do entirely justice to the special resolution that um, fMRI possesses. Um, so one of the questions that became quite prevalent um, in the field over the last two decades is um, whether we can capitalize on this resolution. So what happens if we look at questions that are not necessarily answered in terms of different cortical areas. But let's say we're looking at the very same cortical area that supports object recognition, let's say, um, and see whether different types of objects um, elicit different um, neural signatures within the very same cortical areas. Um, and this seems to make sense, right? Uh, because we have the ability to tell about things like baskets and chairs and fish and horses and teapots. Um, and by and large, all these um, categories of objects tend to, um, to activate um, the same cortical areas. So then how are we able to tell them apart, right? Presumably it's because some neurons um, are more active in some cases than others. And perhaps this... Um, difference um, in the patterns of neural activity is also reflected at the level of um, fMRI spatial patterns, at the level of uh, voxels. So it is entirely possible that baskets um, have their own neural signature um, if we examine different voxels and uh, how active they are in response to baskets. While if we look at chairs, um, that neural signature is going to look um, slightly different. Um, so then the question becomes, how different are these, um, these patterns of activation across voxels within the same cortical area? And how can we uh, what can we do to distinguish between them? Well, in the pattern classification. Um, this is a um, specific field of uh, investigation within um, computer science um, that uh, became widely popular uh, in neuroimaging, in uh, fMRI data analysis, and not only. Um, and um, to capture this specific application of pattern classification to fMRI, um, within this particular field of investigation, it bears the name of multi-voxel pattern analysis, or for short, MVPA. So what this does is try to distinguish neural signatures um, associated with specific um, categories of, uh, of objects or um, categories of stimuli. Um, and then um, try to predict what happens when a participant is shown with a new image, what kind of object category that um, image belongs to. So let's try to unpack that um, a bit more. Uh, what pattern classification does um, is um, use a mathematical model for the purpose of distinguishing neural patterns associated with different categories. Um, in a typical experiment um, that um, is concerned with visual object recognition, for instance, a participant can be presented with many different examples of bottles and many different examples of shoes, right? Um, and then for each presentation of a bottle, we record that neural activation and we do the same for, um, uh, for shoes. Um, and you might imagine that uh, across different presentations of, uh, of different bottles or even of the same bottle, um, there are subtle variations um, in how uh, different voxels within a patch of cortex are activated. But hopefully, um, they're not as dissimilar as the, um, um, the overall difference between um, patterns corresponding to, to bottles and patterns corresponding to um, shoes. So then what we can do is construct a mathematical model, a classifier, essentially a function 
um, that can distinguish between um, the neural patterns associated with those two different categories. And then using that function, uh, we can try to map, we can try to pinpoint the category of a new stimulus presented to a participant based on the neural pattern of activation that um, that specific image um, elicits. So let's say um, if that new um, image is more similar to, um, to uh, um, shoes, then we can um, uh, believe or we can make a claim that that is an um, stimulus, um, visual stimulus that represents a shoe. And similarly, if um, that neural pattern is more similar or more closely related, um, if it resembles more the, um, the neural patterns corresponding to bottles, then we can decide that that is a visual stimulus uh, representing a bottle. Now, no pattern classifier is, um, or rarely is um, the case that upon testing a pattern classific uh, classifier, the performance is um, perfect. So, uh, a lot of the time, the way in which we quantify the success um, of pattern classification is by um, trying to measure the um, um, the accuracy of a um, of the classification procedure, which sometimes is also equated with the um, certainty that the um, classification is correct. Okay, so let's look at some specific um, results um, from a um, um, study published in. Um, um, 2012 um, by Lee and colleagues um, in which they ask people to um, look at different images of bags and cars and chairs and clocks um, and so on and so forth. So participants looked at um, such stimuli but also they were asked to imagine um, the visual appearance of these bags and cars and chairs upon listening to a specific um, cue. So let's say that instead of looking at, uh, at the chair, uh, the participant hears um, the word chair and then um, um, for the next few seconds the participant has to imagine a particular uh, image of a chair in as much visual detail as possible while staring at a blank screen or keeping the, his or her eyes um, closed. In line with uh, previous findings in the um, field, um, the authors of these studies managed to decode the category of the object uh, for perception trials uh, by looking at patterns of uh, neural activation within V1 and um, extra straight cortex. This is a patch of occipital cortex that contains areas such as V4 and V5, as well as more anterior areas from the um, ventral uh, pathway, such as the lateral occipital um, and the posterior fusiform. Um, so this is interesting. Um, the numbers are also quite good, right? So we can see that um, the decoding, the classification performance uh, was, uh, was in the 60, for instance, for um, V1. So about 60% of the time, um, we, the classifier was able to predict correctly the category of an object. However, where things become more interesting and more challenging is for imagery. Uh, and here we see that uh, V1 is not so good at dealing with classification, but uh, more uh, anterior areas of the ventral um, uh, pathway uh, are able to decode above chance. So what that means is that um, classification performance is better than what we uh, would expect if the classifier did nothing or chose a category randomly. So this also points to the difficulty of decoding the content of visual imagery, uh, but it also shows uh, encouraging signs uh, for um, the task of mind reading. Okay, so what does mind reading mean in, um, in this sense? Um, and this is a term that has been quite uh, widely used um, over the last few years um, in the media, in the popular press as well, um, and um, even in um, scientific um, journals and um, articles. And in this specific context, it refers to a class of machine learning techniques 
um, techniques borrowed from uh, computer science uh, for the purpose of decoding or categorizing um, the content of different types of experience. So, for instance, uh, being able to tell what um, kind of object somebody is looking at uh, or what someone is imagining. Um, but the same can, um, can be applied to other types of um, sensory modalities and uh, imagery. So, for instance, we can uh, apply the very same type of techniques um, to decode what type of um, object or sound um, someone is uh, listening to or um, imagining. We can decode what type of um, tactile um, experience uh, someone is going through. Uh, we can decode uh, multimodal um, experiences um, spanning multiple um, types of um, sensory stimulation and so on and so forth. So this is a very powerful um, framework for the purpose of um, using subtle variations um, in the levels of activity um, elicited across um, many voxels um, in response to different types of um, stimulation. Um, however, um, this was just the beginning. Over the last decade, things um, became even more interested um, since um, a number of people tried to um, push the envelope and um, answer even uh, an even bolder question. And that is whether we can not just decode or categorize the type of visual experience that somebody um, is going through, but rather uncover the fine grain detail of that experience. In other words, um, what happens um, if we can try not just to tell whether somebody is looking at a, at a horseman, but rather to reconstruct with detail the visual appearance of the um, stimulus that somebody is looking at as perceived by that um, individual. And that's very challenging because this assumes that um, there is sufficient information at the level of um, patterns of voxels to reflect not just the category of an object, but all the little detail that is um, included in our visual um, experience upon looking at um, the image of, uh, let's say, a horseman in this case. So how might one uh, uh, go about doing um, such a thing? Well, a very powerful uh, approach to doing this relies on um, constructing mathematical models that relate the pixel structure of different images to the voxel structure of um, neural patterns uh, corresponding to um, neural activation in response to those um, images. So in other words, what we're trying to do is build a function that takes as input um, a specific image, a collection of pixels and their values, uh, and maps it onto a neural pattern onto that um, describes the levels of activation corresponding to different voxels. Okay, so this is what it is typically referred to as encoding. And then we can take such a model and um, apply a, um, an operation that inverts it so that this time we can move from patterns of neural activation onto patterns of pixels, aka images. Um, and in this sense, what we're doing is reconstructing the visual experience um, of a participant, uh, building upon the um, structure that we can recover from um, uh, patterns of voxel activation as recorded by fMRI. Okay, so we do not really have the um, time or the resources in this course to go into too much detail uh, with regard to any of this um, MVPA procedures, but uh, it is important to, to know where the field is um, currently in, uh, in this respect. Um, and it also so happens that um, this is a direction of investigation that um, I have um, quite a bit of interest in and um, that has fascinated me for a number of years. So um, along with a couple of collaborators from um, Carnegie Mellon, um, several years back, we looked into the possibility of seeing whether we can reconstruct not just images of chairs and tables um, and sofas um, from um, um, the visual cortex, but whether we can tell apart and reconstruct with a 
fine level of detail images of different individuals um, and indeed by applying a set of machine learning tools uh, we were able to reconstruct with a um, reasonable degree of um, accuracy the appearance of um, faces that um, participants saw in the scanner so again participants in this case look at images of faces we record the neural patterns associated with those um, images and then uh, we apply um, a number of algorithms that convert these neural patterns into um, the visual experience that somebody has upon looking a face, at a face such as this or this uh, and this. Um, and one thing that you can note is that while some uh, visual detail might be missing from this reconstruction, you may be a lot more likely to identify or to map this individual onto this stimulus um, and this reconstruction onto this stimulus uh, rather than, let's say, uh, map this reconstruction onto the um, to a uh, different stimulus. So in this sense, um, reconstruction based upon fMRI was successful. Um, and a lot of our efforts um, across um, several labs um, in the world um, are trying to further boost the uh, accuracy, um, the success and the reliability of the algorithms that are able to, to perform um, such a task. However, um, if you go back to our conversation about different neuroimaging methods, um, you might remember that fMRI is doing quite good at um, spatial resolution, but it's not so good at temporal resolution. Uh, we record um, neural activity, or rather the correlate of neural activity, uh, this temporal resolution of seconds rather than milliseconds. Um, and in that sense, we're limited. So for instance, we know that the brain or a given cortical area has the ability to represent a face in this specific manner. But we do not know uh, how a visual experience evolves. When does a percept, when does a, um, an individual finally have a detailed representation of a face um, in response to a stimulus such as this? However, um, alternative uh, methods that have a higher temporal resolution might be able to answer that question if we apply pattern analysis to the corresponding signals. Um, and um, two years back, uh, one of the postdoctoral fellows in, um, in my lab um, took it upon himself to answer that question. So what he did was apply pattern analysis not to multiple voxels uh, as recorded by fMRI, but across temporal signals recorded uh, um, across electrodes placed on the sc scalp of um, healthy uh, participants. So individuals with um, normal um, levels of um, face and object recognition. So what he did was try to capitalize on the temporal resolution of EEG signals for the purpose of not just reconstructing the appearance of a stimulus, such as the one shown here, but looking at how a percept, a visual experience, is generated over time. And this is one such example of uh, what can happen in response to a typical phase um, over the scope of 600 milliseconds. Um, so one thing that you might be able to notice here is that a uh, consistent um, um, interpretable um, reconstruction appears around 170 milliseconds after uh, one has seen um, a phase. So already um, around 170 milliseconds after seeing a face, um, your visual cortex already has a detailed visual representation of someone's face. Um, and that percept stays with us um, for a while. Um, and that is necessary because uh, over the span of several hundred uh, milliseconds, um, it is quite likely that our brains try to recover additional information about that face, right? So things such as the gender of the face, the race of the face, whether it's a familiar face or an unfamiliar one, and so on um, and so forth. So in this sense, we can look at how a percept is generated, how it persists, and how it evolves um, over time using the um, temporal resolution of EEG and um, pattern classification techniques.
At this point, I should um, also probably mention that um, UTAs have um, considerable levels of um, expertise um, in this field of um, inquiry and uh, methodological investigation. For instance, um, one of them published um, last year a study demonstrating the ability to reconstruct from EEG signals um, the appearance of visual words. So in this study, uh, participants looked at um, um, three-letter words um, and the corresponding um, EEG signals were converted into um, reconstructions of um, those stimuli using dedicated um, algorithms. Um, and this is just another illustration of how powerful techniques for um, um, neural data analysis have, uh, have become with the aid of uh, machine learning and more generally um, artificial intelligence um, methods and um, techniques. And as you might imagine, the um, applications of um, such uh, techniques are just as important as the um, theoretical um, outcomes um, and significance of um, this type of research from a neuroscience perspective. So for instance, mind reading um, is um, nowadays considered in the uh, its potential application to neuroforensics, um, the ability to read an eyewitness um, memory for the purpose of uh, uncovering information related um, to a uh, to an incident. It is used um, um, for the purpose of uh, trying to uncover the visual um, experience of um, patients uh, with different types of disorders. So, for instance, um, it would be fascinating to truly uncover how a uh, prosopagnosic uh, patient views and um, experiences um, faces. And also, um, this happens to be one of my favorite um, directions of um, investigation and um, types of application, uh, recover the ability to um, communicate for patients in um, um, certain states. So for instance, um, several years back, um, Adrian Owen, a um, neuroscientist from, um, from Western, um, argued that uh, about 20% of uh, vegetative uh, patients uh, are actually conscious. They are locked inside um, their own bodies with no possibility to communicate um, because they have no longer uh, proper moral control of their limbs uh, and of their mouths. Um, yet uh, they have the ability to remember, to perceive, to reason and so on and so forth. Um, hence, it is quite possible that neural-based mind reading uh, may be able to provide such uh, patients with a new means of um, communication. So um, it is our hope that some progress uh, in this uh, direction um, can, be, um, can be made soon. And uh, with that, we're concluding the um, theoretical uh, part of our discussion today. However, if you have uh, become hopefully accustomed by now, um, we like to um, add a um, skill building um, component to each lecture and today we're going to start with something which is um, highly relevant, um, reading journal articles. Um, and you might wonder why start um, this in a uh, B-level class, after all that's something that you'll have to do um, quite a bit in C-level and D-level classes. Well, and that's because um, in C-level and D-level classes, um, it is often the case that that ability to successfully approach um, an, uh, an article is taken for, um, taken for granted. And even if not, um, learning how to read a um, journal article is, um, is something that takes time. It's a, it's a skill that you constantly tweak and um, improve upon. So the sooner we, uh, we get started on that, um, the better, I would argue. So by the end of the course, you will by no means be experts in reading your journal articles, but you should have the basics um, in terms of being able to approach an uh, article in um, cognitive neuroscience. There is also a uh, related question, um, and that concerns uh, the um, the need and the use of um, going after journal articles in the first place. Why not stick to a uh, a textbook, right? After all, um, our course relies on um, 
famous on a leading textbook um, put together by um, some of the most reputed, um, most famous um, neuroscientists um, to date. And the reason for that is um, that no matter how good a textbook is, um, it provides a certain view uh, of the field. It provides you with information that has been previously digested by a group of experts um, and then um, simplified and summarized so that um, it appeals to a broader audience of, let's say, students. Um, so in that way, you do not necessarily have access to the original literature um, and that can be a, a limiting factor in your ability to truly understand um, the validity of the research and the significance of the, um, the research in the field at a given moment in time. Um, hence, it is the goal of this um, course also to increase fluency um, in um, your ability to approach the primary literature in the field which most of the time comes in the form of journal um, articles. This should increase confidence um, in your ability to find and evaluate information by yourselves. Uh, it creates space for intellectual independence and freedom. And interestingly enough, uh, because conventions in science govern um, the way of disseminating um, information across fields, um, a certain way of thinking and a certain um, skill set developed in neuroscience may easily transfer to your ability to um, have a look and uh, approach um, articles from completely different fields, um, from medical fields, um, from, let's say, um, earth sciences, um, environmental sciences, and so on and so forth. From an even broader perspective, um, this should help you um, develop uh, a skill um, related to information processing. Um, and it is the case that um, the evolution of um, internet and our constant and increasing dependence of technology have, um, have created um, some very interesting challenges um, for um, our ability to select and uh, digest information. Um, there is more information than ever to, to sift through um, and we're not always sure how we should be evaluating that um, information. Um, even science um, is often misrepresented. It is misrepresented in, um, in the news, in um, social media, in politics for the purpose of um, feeding someone's agenda or um, for uh, propaganda reasons. Um, hence, your ability to take a, um, an approach informed by um, healthy skepticism uh, and your ability to identify, to pinpoint um, the source, um, the, the true source of scientific information uh, and its potential validity are crucial. Okay, so um, hopefully this is um, a strong enough argument um, to um, garner um, sufficient interest in um, developing and um, sharpening this ability um, to approach a, a journal article. Now, there are many different types of um, scientific papers. Um, empirical articles are the primary um, source of information um, in um, neuroscience. Um, however, um, review articles can be um, highly seminal in the field uh, because they can summarize um, some of the major findings um, and add on the opinion of some experts in the field. Um, we also have meta-analysis um, that um, try to reassess a number of uh, um, uh, empirical articles and um, apply new analysis to previous sets of um, um, results um, and so on and so forth. However, because of the um, primary aspect um, represented by empirical articles, we will be focusing on them. Um, and as you might know, probably by now, um, there are five core parts of um, a conventional empirical uh, journal uh, article. There's an abstract, a um, summary of um, um, the um, results um, presented in an article. There's a, um, an introduction that attempts to ground the um, study um, in, um, in the current state of the field um, 
and to foreshadow sometimes um, its results and its conclusions. Um, there's a method section um, that typically tells you what is being done and how. Um, there's a uh, results section that um, tries to detail the, um, the outcomes of applying a certain set of uh, analysis to, um, to the data. And then there's a discussion that provides an, uh, a summary and in an interpretation of, um, of the findings, um, as well as um, sometimes a um, a list of caveats and um, future directions of um, research that um, the authors believe are uh, uh, well uh, motivated by um, uh, the current state of, uh, of the field. Okay, so over the next uh, five lectures, um, including today, we will discuss each one of these five typical parts of a uh, journal uh, article. Um, and today we're going to focus on, uh, on the abstract. So what does an abstract do? Well, its general goal is to give you a broad overview of the core features of an, uh, of an article. So what this means is that most of the time, um, the structure of an abstract also mirrors more or less the, um, the structure of a uh, scientific article. So um, it will probably provide you with an introduction. It will most definitely uh, provide you with methods and results. And sometimes you will also try to conclude with a brief discussion. Um, hence, an abstract is useful for at least two reasons. First of all, if you really have to go through that paper, um, it will provide you with some scaffolding. Um, it will um, give you a basic understanding of what you should be expecting uh, when you're going through that um, article. So nothing that you uh, find in that article should come as a complete surprise. You have already been warned uh, about the content um, and the findings um, of, that, um, of that article. Um, you should never read a scientific article and um, um, reach a, um, a cliffhanger. Um, everything should be expected uh, based on what the abstract um, already told you from the very beginning. Uh, another important reason is to determine whether a paper should be read at all, right? So let's say you're trying to put together a survey for a class, a review of the literature, uh, and you're um, skimming over a whole number of papers. But reading a paper or even glancing through the paper um, can take time. Hence, just um, taking a quick look at the abstract can inform you whether that has potential value um, for your um, review of the literature or not. Okay, so then um, the next question is, how should we read um, an abstract? Um, and because um, an abstract is relatively concise, uh, it makes sense um, to read it at least um, twice or um, even three times. Um, in a couple of sentences, it tries to summarize uh, what's going on in that article. Um, and then, um, if you truly care about um, what the uh, abstract tells you, what that piece of research um, means, um, you should try to um, summarize the abstract in your own words. It is often the case that we look at something, we read, we think that we understand, and then as we try to explain it, let's say to somebody else, we realize that our understanding is not as um, complete uh, and um, accurate as we thought it was. Um, hence, trying to um, rephrase um, the abstract in our own words um, is, uh, is a very interesting and useful exercise, especially um, at, uh, at this level. Okay, so now without further ado, um, let's go over a couple of uh, abstracts um, and see how they can be decomposed. Um, and they do not necessarily um, represent anything that we have touched upon already in this course. Uh, and this is with good reason, because many times, if not uh, most of the time, you're going to um, go through an article that um, details or relies on concepts um, that you have never heard of before, right? Yet you should still be able to process the structure of the abstract and get a general understanding of what's going on in that study. Okay, so let's look at this um, abstract first. Um, and I'm going to, going to read through it uh, and try to argue as to the um, 
um, category of um, each statement, each sentence uh, within the abstract. In the present study, we investigated whether the visually allocated beam studied by Posner and others is the same visual attentional resource that performs the role of feature integration in Trisman's model. Well, clearly the goal of this statement um, is to provide you with an intro, right? It tries to embed the, the current research um, into the field and it also tries to motivate it in that manner. It introduces some basic concepts, um, though you probably might not know what a visually allocated beam is or the feature integration um, theory uh, or um, Trisman's model. Uh, but um, just by looking at the fact that um, this is um, introducing what appears to be major and well-known concepts in the field, you can appreciate the fact that this is an introduction and not, let's say, the methods uh, or the results part of the uh, abstract. Okay, then we go into a bit of detail uh, about what the subjects do um, and what type of, um, of stimuli they look at. Subjects were queued to attend to a certain special location by a visual cue and performance at expected and unexpected stimulus locations uh, was uh, compared. Subjects searched for a letter R with distractor letters that either could give rise to uh, illusory conjunctions or could not. Okay, so we know what the subjects do. Um, we know um, what they're looking at um, and we know how um, performance is assessed. Hence, this is the methods part of the abstract. Okay, so let's see what happens next. Findings from three separate experiments show that orienting attention in response to central cues, endogenous orienting, showed similar effects for both conjunction and feature search. Uh, well, the keyword here is findings, which already cues you um, as to the fact that um, this is a results um, section. However, when attention was oriented with peripheral visual cues, exogenous orienting, conjunction search showed larger effects of attention than did feature search. So this second, uh, this final sentence here uh, aims to um, qualify uh, the previous one uh, with respect to findings. Hence, this is also labeled here as a results uh, part of the abstract. Interestingly enough, this abstract does not have a discussion. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, many times um, the authors of a study um, are highly limited in the number of sentences and words they can place in an abstract um, under restrictions posed by, uh, by a journal. Um, hence, if anything has to go, it is either the introduction or the discussion. So in that case, you rely on um, an informed audience to, to look at the uh, at your abstract and your paper and um, and go through it. So while this might not be the most complete way um, to, to put together an abstract, it is yet um, still common um, in, um, in psychology and in um, neuroscience. However, the methods and the results section are critical and um, you should always be able to um, locate them successfully in an uh, abstract. Okay, let's, um, let's take a look then at um, yet another abstract. Okay, so um, this new abstract is telling us that two experiments modeled after JDC's 1959 study revealed remarkable levels of false recall and false recognition uh, in a least learning paradigm. Well, because um, this is trying to relate the present um, study to previous work um, in the field, um, it appears to be introduction. However, it also seems to foreshadow um, the results of, uh, of the study. However, because of the placing of this um, sentence, I would label this as introduction rather than uh, um, results. Next, um, in experiment one, subjects studied lists of 12 words, um, bed, rest, awake, each list was composed of associates of one non-represented word, sleep. Uh, well, this is telling us what the subjects do um, and uh, what the um, stimuli consist um, of. Um, hence, this is probably methods. On um, immediate free recall tests, the non-represented associates were recalled 40% of the time and were later recognized with high confidence. Well, this is starting to detail the results, um, hence um, it should be labeled appropriately. 
An experiment to a false recall of 55% was obtained with an expanded set of lists and, on a later recognition test, subjects produced false alarms to these items at a rate com comparable to the hit rate. Okay, so this is mostly results, but I've also um, identified um, two parts of this sentence as, uh, as methods, um, since um, they provide additional details about the methodology, the use of an expanded set of lists, and the fact that um, this is coming from a second experiment. Okay, moving on. The act of recall enhanced later remembering of both studied and non-studied material. So this also seems to summarize a, a portion of the, of the results. Okay, as to the last um, sentence, this states that the results reveal a powerful illusion of memory. People remember events that never happened. So this is a... Um, quite a representative way of um, finishing an abstract. You're trying to um, summarize in one statement uh, what the uh, what the study um, means, um, essentially, what its results provide, um, and also um, phrase the significance uh, of the study in a, in a way that is accessible to a, um, to a larger audience. People remember events that never happened. So that should be something that uh, most people should be able to understand, um, even um, without scientific training. Um, okay, so now let's move on to a final abstract. But um, instead of going through it um, right away, I'm going to ask you um, uh, if you wish to practice that skill to pause the lecture, read the abstract, um, and try to um, uh, label each um, sentence um, of, uh, of the abstract um, accordingly with um, introduction methods, results, and discussion um, um, corresponding labels. Okay, assuming that um, you managed to go through this um, abstract successfully, uh, we can move on to the next slide, which um, hopefully aligns quite well with uh, what um, you thought of the um, uh, labeling of this um, sentences. Okay, and uh, with that being said, we have um, reached the end of this lecture. Um, next, um, next week, we will continue um, to talk about um, other parts of a um, scientific um, article. And we're also going to um, delve into the neuroscience of um, attention.